Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jeremy Snodgrass, youth pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. Amen. This morning, I want to share with you a word that I've entitled uh, Eternal Security. And uh, before we get on, I want to say something, you guys. I was talking to Bob last week, and uh, just to make sure you guys know what I'm doing. You know those youth pastors, sometimes they can be a little crazy. But if you see me on Sundays standing and staring at you and standing there with my phone, I promise you I'm not playing video games on my phone, okay? All right. Uh, a while back ago, you guys know that we uh, did a whole updated system uh, with our attendance and with our contacts and all that. And so I have um, attendance is on my phone. And so if I'm staring at you, I'm not judging you, I promise. I'm not doing it today, but every week um, I'm the attendance taker. So I'll stand in the back and you'll see me with my phone um, up against the wall or anything. I'm taking attendance. I am not playing video games, okay? I just wanted to make that clear in case any, did anybody actually wonder that? I hope not. You better not raise your hand. Uh, but anyway, just to make that clear and uh, to let you guys know uh, what's going on with that and uh, how we take attendance uh, every single week. All right, eternal security. We're going to be in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 today. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. How many know that security is important to us? Security is important to us. Security is important to us. Financial security is important to us. It's something how many... Um, how many have lost sleep over financial security? Come on, you know what I'm saying. How many have ever been at that point? Uh, you know, the security in our life is a big deal, even personal security and uh, uh, security of our family. And, you know, honestly, guys, I don't go anywhere um, anymore without without carrying uh, two weapons uh, with me. And um, they're called lightning and thunder. And... Um, <laughs> And, and you know, how many know security is important? Come on now. Come on. How many know? Man, that was close. I think I almost ripped my shirt when I did that, but that was pretty close. But, um, <laughs> but security, security is very, very important to each and every one of us. Well, when it comes to our eternity, how many know security is important? How many know it is good to know that we are eternally secure in the power of Jesus Christ, that we, through the blood of Jesus Christ, can be secure in our salvation, in our walk with God? And today, I want to just uh, kind of go through this scripture today and talk a little bit about eternal security and what brings eternal security in our life, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when that day comes, when we bring our last breath or when the trumpet sounds and God comes back for his people that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're going to be going to that great reward that Jesus Christ has given us. Amen. Praise God. So I want to talk today in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 through 11 really lays out what it means to have that promise of heaven, to have that promise of, of security about our eternal home. Amen. And in verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who serve the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. How many know that this faith we have is so precious? Come on, I said, how many know this faith we have is so precious? It says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these quality in increasing measure, they will keep you, 
They, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. If you do these things, you will never stumble, and you receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many look forward to that day when we can stand before God and receive that rich welcome into the kingdom of God? Amen. Amen. I want to break this down today and kind of go through the scripture and talk about what it says here in in the book of first or second Peter, sorry, talking about exactly what it means to have that eternal security that that talks about in verse 11 of, of knowing that we will be welcomed into the kingdom of God. What, what is the process? What is it that God has given us to enable that eternal security that we can live in through Jesus Christ? And the first thing that we need to know is this. In verse 3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So listen, we have everything we need through his divine power to live a godly life. Listen, we have everything we need through him to live a godly life. And not only do we have everything through his divine power to live that godly life, it's the only possible way we as human beings can live a godly life. There is nothing that we can do within ourselves to, to deserve salvation, to deserve the kingdom of God, eternity in heaven. But it's only through the divine power that was shed on the cross through the blood of Jesus Christ that gives us the opportunity to have that holy life, to be righteous before the Lord. And so we know, listen, listen, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the only way. But we also know that through that divine power, that divine power that is talked about in verse 3, that that power secures us in Christ. That divine power is everything we need to live a godly life. Listen, we've got to understand We've got to understand that we are called to live a godly life. I said, we've got to understand that we are called to live a godly life. And I thank God that we don't have to do it on our own, on our own because I know that I would fail, and I know that each and every one of you would fail. But I also thank God that I can live a godly life because of the divine power of God that lives inside of me. Listen. I can say no to sin. You can say no to sin. Not because you're anything special, but because he's everything. Because of his divine power, we can say no to sin in our life. We can live that godly life and that power that divine power in us will secure us and it will keep us from sin when we allow the power and the divine power to work in our life on a daily basis. It will secure us. It will bring us safe. It will bring us close to Jesus. It will, it, we will be able to do this. In verse 4, it says this. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through him, listen to this, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desire. Listen, he, this is, I mean, this is exciting. I'm sorry, I have to come down here for this. He has enabled us to live with a new nature. He has enabled us to live in the divine nature of God. That means that we, through the divine power of God, can change who we are. Come on, that's exciting. We do not have to give in 
to our sin nature. You know, some people think, well, I've just come to terms with that. I'm always going to be a sinner. So, you know, I'll just do my best, I guess. I'll just do the best that I can in through this life and, you know, pray to God one day that I'll make it. Listen, we've got it all wrong. Jesus Christ came. And because he came, we can change our very nature and who we are through his divine power. That's good news. And I'll be honest with you, this scripture right here, nobody can have an excuse anymore that says, well, it's just me. I'm human. I, I, I'm just going to keep on sin. I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm going to do. Nobody. Because God says, no, because of the price that I paid on the cross, I made a way for you to say no to sin, to say no to those lusts and those fleshly desires, to the desires of this sinful world, and to live a godly life. He secures us. He secures us. He enables us to say no to our sin nature and say yes to the divine nature of God in living, in living as God, as God has taught us through his word. So when we begin to look at that, we understand that living a godly life takes work. Come on. I said living a godly life takes work. You know, a lot of times when people give their heart to the Lord, a lot of times there's some really big decisions that they have to make. People have to separate themselves from people that they may have been friends for life. They can no longer go and do that with them. They can no longer go and do this. People have to make decisions about the way and the pattern that they lived all their life, and it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Doing this takes effort. Living that holy life takes effort. And we look through uh, verses 4, I'm sorry, verses 5 through 8, and it says this, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and then from goodness, knowledge to knowledge, self-control, from self-control to perseverance, perseverance to godliness, and godliness to mutual affection, and mutual affection to love. He outlines, and, and you know what I love? I love the word of God. I love the Word of God. I love when I read the Word of God and I can see just the power and the truth just leaping from the words as we read them. And we see this in 2 Peter in the first chapter. We see the outlining of what brings eternal security in your life. So he goes on and he first states that, listen, it's only by the divine power, but, but through that divine power you can. And then he begins to challenge us and says, here's what you need to work on, people. Here's what you need to make every effort to do. Goodness. How many know goodness is a good thing? For goodness sake. I can, I can keep going all day. And so, and so goodness is a good thing to have. You know, as I look over my life and growing up in the church and, and being in ministry for 20 years, some of the most incredible people that have made a difference in my life, the very first word that comes uh, to my mind about them is, man, they are just really good people all around. You know, we sang a song just right just a little bit ago, that he is good. He is good. He is good. We sing that because God is good. And God asks us, listen, I've saved you. I've given you divine power. Now start the process of begin adding my very nature to make it your very nature. And he starts and he talks about goodness and how we need to be good. We need to be good to people. We need to, we need to care about what's going on in other people's life. We need to be a, a person that goodness is something that we work towards. How many know that a lot of times it's not our nature? Hey, listen, I know some, I, how many people had that person in your neighborhood when you were growing up that you know that if your baseball or your Frisbee or whatever went in their yard, it was gone forever. Come on. Yes. Our, this is my, in my neighborhood, 
that was Crazy Joe. And that's what we called him, Crazy Joe. Crazy Joe, that if you were walking down the sidewalk in front of his house, and even if you accidentally stepped in his yard, I think he stayed at the window all day, waited, and he would come out and just start screaming at you, just screaming, get out of my yard! And just all of this kind of stuff. I mean, it was just like, you know what I'm saying. Everybody had, listen, how many know it's in our nature sometimes to not be a very good person? Come on. It's in our nature. I remember one time, it was the last baseball that we had. Nobody had a baseball between us, and, and we had hit it. Um, actually, I'd hit it and hit it over, in, over the fence in his yard. And because I was the one that hit it, it was my responsibility to, to go. And I'm not, I can remember how scared I was. I remember the fear that was in my, in my heart, my mind. And I went, and, uh, and I'll never forget, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do it. I can't, you know, let these, all these guys think that I'm a wimp, you know. And, and so I did it. And I went, and I, I just did a running start, and I went. And I just jumped, and I hit the top of the fence, and boom, I went a dead, I mean, a dead run. I got the ball. I'm telling you, as soon as I grabbed that ball, I hear this screaming, and I'm just like, Jesus. And, you know, and I just, I mean, I'm telling you, this guy had to be watching constantly. And, and, and I, but I made it back. Uh, my life was saved. I think, I'm pretty sure he went to my dad and said to something to my dad about keep your son out of my yard, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but anyway, and so... Listen, by nature, a lot of times we're not very good. So we need to make every effort to begin to instill these things into our life. Knowledge, self-control. Self-control is something that the Lord has enabled me through the many, many times that I have been hurt to begin to uh, develop self-control in my life. Because how many know sometimes when you get hurt, it's easy to lose control? Come on now. It's easy. And I've hurt myself so many times in my life that my natural response at this point is, thank you, Jesus. That, that's what I say. Sometimes we want to say some different things, don't we? We want to start taking some things and, um, and throwing things. I know when I was young, and I, uh, how many know it, it, it doesn't do anybody any good or yourself to lose control? Come on now. And I remember when I was young, one time um, I let my dog out. And I was trying to shut the back door, and it would not shut, and it made me so mad. And I was like, so finally I got, I, I sit there, and I, I took my hand, and I was just going to slam it. And I figured I'd get some leverage on the, on, the, uh, on the doorway. And, of course, I put my thumb right over, and I, my, I just crushed my thumb. I got so mad, I lost control, that I went over, and I, and I punched the wall. And, unfortunately, I hit right on the two-by-four where the wall was at. And so now, not only did I have a crushed thumb, but I had a crushed fist um, on top of it. And how many know it's not good to lose control? Come on. It's not good to lose control. But listen, God asked us to work on these things in our life. Uh, perseverance. Listen, don't lose heart. You're going to go through hard and difficult times. There's going to be times where you're fighting against that sin nature. But God is saying, persevere, persevere. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Hold on to me. Keep strong. Add these things to our life. Godliness, mutual affection, love, all of these things. The Bible says in verse 8, it says, For if, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, then I'm sorry, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. So in other words, listen, as we begin to allow our nature to be changed and we allow these things to be incorporated and added to our life, then the Bible says that we then will be productive and we will be effective in our work for Jesus Christ, in our walk with Jesus Christ. How many want to be effective? How many want to be a productive Christian in this place? And when we allow Allow these things. Listen, they will be a testimony to the world because we'll be different than everybody outside these four walls of this church. It will be different, and they'll see a goodness and a love that it comes from a divine nature, not from ours, but a divine nature, and they will be attracted to it. They will want to know what it is. Listen, we are here to engage the world. We're not here to hide from it. We're not here to sit back and hold on until Jesus comes. 
We are meant to engage this world just like Jesus Christ did. He engaged the sin. He engaged the lifestyles. But he did it with a love beyond love. And when we become more and more like him in our divine nature, and we go out and we begin to bring this word out of the love of Jesus Christ, how many know that lives are going to be changed? The world needs you. We need to show them what it's like for a life to be changed in Jesus Christ. Got a question for you. How is your eyesight? In verse 9, it says this, but whoever does not have them, talking about all of these attributes, all these things that uh, represent God in the divine nature of life. It says, but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Listen, do you not see that God saved you and therefore expects you to follow him in his ways? Are you, have you been blinded? But you know what? There's a lot of people that are walking around in the church that are blinded today. There's a lot of pastors that are blinded, that are preaching a message that is not the word of God. Listen, have you been blinded? Because listen, when God sets you apart, he expects you then to follow him. If we have been cleansed, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have not been cleansed to jump back into the mud puddle. We have not been all washed up. How many has ever got their kids ready for something? You're going somewhere, going to church, and the next thing you know, you turn around and they're filthy. They went outside. They got all their clothes. Come on, how many's ever had that before? And, and they just get their clothes dirty. I remember one time um, way back in the 80s, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Way back in the 80s, uh, a popular trend um, happened. And the popular trend was, you know, blue jeans were popular, but um, white jeans. So white jeans. How many remember that back in the 80s? White blue jeans. They're, I don't, can't really call them blue jeans because they're white jeans. Uh, but white jeans became popular. And I'll never forget, my mom and dad bought my oldest sister a pair of white jeans, and we were getting ready for church one day. It's Sunday morning. We're getting ready for church, and my sister was so excited, and they bought, uh, they bought those white jeans for her because she wanted them so bad, and, and she was all excited uh, to wear those white jeans. And that night, it had rained pretty much the whole night. And I remember forget, I think me and my younger sister, we were out the door first, but then here comes my older sister just bolting out the door. She was so excited to get to church that day because she had the new white jeans that everybody was wearing. And she went, and we had a step and then a sidewalk, and she was, like, leaping. So she went off that top step, and instead of landing on the sidewalk, the cement, her foot landed in the grass outside of it, which the grass was drenched in a mud puddle right there. And I'll never forget seeing my sister's feet go up over her heads, doing almost a complete flip and landing in the mud puddle with her new white jeans. And I remember my mom and my dad, and they were just like this, throwing their hands up. It was like, man, we got you this. What? We got you these jeans. Um, did you know that you're, these are white jeans? You can't go running out in the yard with white jeans and, and all of this kind of stuff. And, and it wasn't good because those jeans were done for. I mean, she literally just completely destroyed them. I just imagine, how does, how does Jesus feel when he takes our old garments, stained, nasty, and replaces them with a pure white garment of salvation and our sins being forgiven? How, how does he feel when we take that precious gift of the blood of Jesus And go and use that gift to jump back in the mud puddle. Doesn't make much sense, does it? But some people today have used that forgiveness and the grace of God as a license to jump in the mud puddle. But when we read the word of God, we know that that is not what God's plan and intention was. His intention was to change us. His intention was to change our divine 
nature and, and to replace our sinful nature with this divine nature. That's what his plan, not to be saved, to go out and sin more. That's not what we're called to. We're called to place the divine nature of God on our lives. That's what God has called us to. How is your eyesight? I want to tell you something. There is no eternal security in a sinful lifestyle. There will be some people that would argue with me on that. But there is no eternal security in a sinful lifestyle. When you knowingly and willingly engage in sin, and that's your lifestyle, there is no eternal security in that kind of life. It's not possible. It doesn't exist in my Bible. It doesn't exist. God saved us to change us. Last thing this morning. It says in verse 10 and 11, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort, listen, to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Confirming your call brings eternal security. What does that mean, to confirm your call? Confirming your call equals taking up your cross and following Jesus every day. Confirming your call is taking up your cross and following Jesus every day. It's taking up your cross and, and taking that, that flesh and those evil desires that are our nature and crucifying them every single day and giving them over to Jesus and picking up your cross every single day and following Jesus. Listen, when we're picking up our cross every single day, when we're walking to Jesus, when we're, when we're beginning to place goodness and perseverance and self-control, and we're beginning to walk that way and walk towards Jesus more and more. And every day when we pick up our cross, we are confirming that Christ changed our life. In a confirming, listen, when we confirm our walk with Jesus and we pick up our cross every single day, listen, you will never stumble you will never stumble when you're picking up your cross every single day. No, that doesn't make sense. Well, listen, this isn't what I said. Listen to what the Word of God says again. So it goes and it, and it begins to talk about, and it's just bringing a close to this section right here. It says, when you, for if you do these things, listen, and you confirm your calling, walking towards Jesus, picking up your cross every single day, listen, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. How many know that's the kind of security I want to live in? That's the kind of security I know that every day if I pick up my cross and I'm going towards Jesus, and if I never let go of my cross and I'm always following him, then the Bible says I won't stumble, I won't fall, but I will constantly, constantly be going towards him. But the truth is this, over the last 20 years, many times I've talked to so many different people that are struggling, that are struggling with their sin nature. They're struggling with the life that, the, that they're living. And I'll begin talking to them, and it goes to the same thing every day. Every, every single time it goes to the same thing. As I begin to talk to them, and we begin to walk backwards, how did this start? Do you know how it started with them every single time? is that every single time they stopped at one point and one time in their life, they stopped picking up their cross and following Jesus every day. Well, yeah, well, yeah, Pastor Jeremy, I, yeah, I, I, I stopped learning God's word. I stopped reading. I stopped, I stopped um, gaining my knowledge of the word God. What about your prayer? You know what? I haven't really done that much. I haven't. When you stop picking up your cross and following Jesus, you're going to be in trouble. That's why every day we've got to hold on to the cross every single day with the passion. And because I know, listen, I know that it's not me. I know it's only God. But I have faith and I have trust that through the power and his divine power that I can live a holy life. 
And that's why I pick up my cross every single day. Because I can't do it without picking up the cross of Jesus Christ. Every single day. Listen, you'll never stumble when you're picking up your cross every day and following Jesus. And the bottom line is this, when we talk about eternal security, love that in verse 11. It says, when we do this, that we'll receive a rich, listen, a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, come on. I, I, I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. That makes me excited that me, Jeremy Snodgrass, has a way to spend eternity with the creator of all things because of his love for me. Because of the divine power that he has given me through the salvation, through Jesus Christ. Because of that, that one day I could spend eternity with him for all, forever, forever, and forever. And that's where our eternal security comes. When we begin every single day to replace our sinful nature with God's divine nature through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to ask this morning, I don't know who's all here, where, where you're at in your life, but I have to ask this morning, if you're in this place and you don't have a relationship with God, or maybe you maybe did at one time, but honestly, where you're at, you've went back to your sinful nature and you're living willingly, you're living in a sinful nature. I want you to know today that Jesus Christ loves you, that he has come today to save you, to change your life, to start you on the right path towards him. And if today, if you're saying, Pastor Jeremy, I want to make that decision to have Jesus Christ come into life, I want to make him my Lord and my Savior. Today, today, I want my divine nature to be changed, to follow him, to serve him. And today, I want to make that stand and proclaim Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And today, you want him. You know that you're at that place. And today, you want to make that change. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for that hand. Thank you, Jesus, for that hand. Hallelujah. If you can help me today, we're just going to pray a prayer. The Word of God teaches us that if we confess Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior, that he's God's one and only son whom he raised from the dead, that we shall be saved. And today, for the person who raised their hand or for maybe if you didn't, but you know that if you confess him today, that your sins will be forgiven. They will be wiped away and you will be given a new life, a new chance to walk in righteousness and holiness. So if you could, in this place, just repeat after me. And if you're in here and you're praying this, and you know that this is the decision you need to make and you want to make that today, I want you to know that Jesus will save you today. He will take away your sins today. If you could, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today, and I accept Jesus Christ your one and only son who died for me and who you rose again. I accept him as my Lord and Savior. Now, Jesus, I pray that with my life, I will put on your divine nature of righteousness and holiness God, give me strength 
Give me the power to say no to sin and yes to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this morning, just want to ask one more question. If you're in here in your heart of heart's desire is to live the divine nature of God, to allow the Holy Spirit to change you, to make you more like Him. In your heart's desire is to honor God with your lifestyle, with who you are. And in your heart of hearts, your desire is to one day to stand before God and him look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. If that's your heart of heart's desire, I want you to stand in this place. This morning, if you bow your heads, close your eyes, I want to pray a prayer over you. Heavenly Father, today, you see our heart. God, our heart and our desire is to love you. God, to be more like you. And God, I pray over your people today, Lord God. And God, I pray that your divine power will lead them, Lord God. That your divine power, Lord God, will cause them, Lord God, every day to take up your cross and to follow you, Lord Jesus. That every day they will say no to sin and yes to you, Lord Jesus. God, I pray every day, Lord God, every day, Lord God, as they walk this journey, that they will become more and more like you. God, let goodness fill their life. Let love, Father, fill their life. God, I pray over them, Lord God. And God, every day, Lord God, every day, Lord Jesus, I pray that they will persevere. They will persevere even when the journey gets hard, even when the journey gets difficult, even when they get tired, that they will persevere. And every day they will follow you that God, every single one of us in this room one day will be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, Lord God. Pour out of them, Holy Spirit. And we say thank you for your divine power that enables us to live for you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We love you this morning. Go out today. Pick up your cross and follow him.